précieux. Mmh. Good afternoon. Welcome to the session uh, on a day without satellites. My name is Ram Jaku. I'm from the Institute of Air and Space Law at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Last night at a dinner, somebody made a presentation on cyber security. And the data this gentleman described was fascinating. He said that there are five billion devices connected to internet, and there are half a billion smart phones connected to internet. Now, very few people know the benefits of internet, because what we know is the benefit of the computers, not the internet and extremely few people know the risks when you lose internet. And that situation is very much similar to the satellites. The satellites I describe, I consider them invisible hand, invisible device or tool or means to make not only really internet uh, internet work, but other devices. So the question here before us, the topic is a day without satellites. We would like to start this session a satellite with satellites. That means what are the benefits of satellites for industry and society as a whole, for you and for, for me? And then we'll see what are uh, what are the risks to the sustainable use of satellites? What are the threats uh, to the use of satellites, risks and threats? And then we'll get into what should be done to mitigate these risks or eliminate these risks and to expand the benefits of, of satellites. So these are the three main questions which has come out of the five questions mentioned in the program. What we'd certainly like to have relatively longer questions and answer session. We will very much appreciate your questions and our panel will describe their answer or try to answer the questions. The panelists here um, are very well experienced, knowledgeable uh, in the utilization of satellites. We have representative or people working with industry, private industry, a person working with NGO, and our lady from European Space Agency working in the government. And I'm from the academia. So that means it's a good variety of, of people, those who are here to, to, to address this issue. We will start with our <coughs> first panelist, Ray Johnson, who is a senior vice president and chief technology fellow with Lockheed Martin, a, a private corporation in the United States, one of the top manufacturers of the, of the satellite. So Ray, here we are. What do you, what you think about the benefits of satellites for the society and for the industry? Thank you, Ram. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'll do uh, a little bit of an introduction, uh, which will kind of introduce the theme that some of the other panel members will be talking about. I'll begin by introducing some of the benefits, the challenges, and the risks associated with space. Uh, as, as many of you know, space is an essential tool for global security uh, and safety, and uh, has many capabilities and benefits that we often take for granted, which is, I think, what Ram was talking about when comparing it to the Internet. Uh, and, and space benefits mankind in many ways. A few of the examples that will make it, I think, very clear to you, the first one is very easy, and that's navigation. 
and GPS devices and other location-based devices. And so there are uh, currently uh, about one billion GPS devices on the planet. And, and, and it's not just GPS, it's not just maps and cars, it's also your iPhone. So when your iPhone, you say, uh, can I talk, can I, can I give you some information about something that's near you? You answer yes, well, it's using your location, typically using GPS to give you that location. Another area is space exploration um, and observation, both the human space flight component and also the science missions uh, that many nations around the world are taking part in. Uh, satellite television and more broadly just uh, entertainment-based communication. Uh, weather observations and forecasting, uh, communications in general, telecommunications, national security, uh, disaster management, and environmental monitoring. The environmental monitoring is not just uh, monitoring of the environment, which you might consider a science mission. It's also food security, uh, wetlands, resources, uh, a broad variety of uses there. But for space to provide security, uh, space must be secure. And so there are, there are risks to space. Uh, there are risks to the satellites that are in space. And a few of those risks are, uh, number one, space debris. Uh, space debris is interesting to me when I looked over uh, the World Economic Forum Global Risk 2012. In that document, space debris was one of the lowest rated risks in terms of, of uh, threat to mankind, threat to the world. Uh, not going to assess whether that's proper or not, but it is, uh, it is a, in fact, a statistical fact. But I think it speaks to the fact that people maybe don't understand all the risks associated with, the, um, with what uh, those objects can do to satellites and the, and the impact that it could have. Uh, solar flares, other near-Earth objects, uh, and spectrum issues. Uh, spectrum issues having to do with the radio frequency spectrum and the need to allocate uh, frequencies that can be used. Uh, also, secondary impacts, if you think about losing uh, space assets, downturn to economics, trade, commerce, heightened political international tensions. Part of the national security component of space is awareness of what other people are doing. And so with that awareness comes a sense of security. Uh, natural disasters and the resultant uh, loss of life and property. And then transportation coordination issues, uh, especially air transport. You can think of space and the satellites as having this triad. And the triad is interesting because it conflict between all of these. Uh, the competition, the conflict, and the cooperation that nations of the world uh, now experience with regard to space. So how to prevent these problems? Uh, international cooperation on space issues and policies and procedures. Collaboration on, on space debris and near-Earth objects tracking and mitigation. And so to kind of summarize as we begin uh, introducing the other panelists, uh, many of today's complex Global security challenges involve space as a component of the solution, probably something that's not recognized broadly. Uh, and what we're seeing today is that no single nation, not even the United States, is able to go it alone in space. And so that speaks to the need for collaboration. Uh, cooperation is essential, and so the U.S. and other space-faring nations must commit to a global collaboration. And uh, because of this collaborative environment, we need to also look at space from a systems engineering problem where you can think about developing affordable solutions uh, to solve many of these problems that I've talked about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, I'm fascinated by three elements you mentioned. To ensure space security, space must be secure. I think that's, that's very good. The second is competition, cooperation, and collaboration. They are existing or they, they are prevalent at the same time. It's fascinating to see that. Uh, intro good introduction to the subject. Our next speaker is Shari Naza. She's the head of the strategic studies for European Space Agency. Um, it is logical or natural for me to ask her uh, two type of questions, I would say. First thing is we are in Europe. Uh, the European Space Agency spends about 4 billion euros per year is the fourth largest spender uh, in the world on space. What benefits the European taxpayers get of spending $4 billion? And, and second euros, thing is euros. again, uh, and with respect to euros, so, euro, sorry, <laughs> I'm used to talking uh, <laughs> uh, And also the, the benefits of satellites for 
um, special purposes, something like disaster management, water management, food security, climate change. Shelby. Okay, Thank Ram, you. easy questions there. Yeah, <laughs> okay, yes. Wait. So indeed, <laughs> the European Space Agency uh, budget is about 4 billion euros per year, which <coughs> amounts uh, about one uh, cinema ticket per year and per European. So it's not much when you look at it in retrospect. It's much less than what we spend on lottery uh, games or f pet food or whatever, things like that. But I would like to say for those, billion, for those 4 billion euros, Europeans as a whole get a lot of return. Uh, economic return, that is a demonstrated fact uh, that each euro invested in space has an economic return in terms of industrial competitiveness, in terms of highly qualified employment, and not an employment that can be delocalized. It's an employment which is within Europe. Uh, in, in, we have had several studies uh, done which show that the return is between two and four, depending on the sector. So for each euro invested, Europe gets two to four euros uh, in terms of economic return. But economic return is not all. And I think uh, you, you, you said that Europe uh, is the fourth uh, largest spender. I'm not sure about being a spender. Uh, there are major space powers in the world, obviously uh, the US, the major space power, but China is now a very large space power, Russia, and also Europe, Japan, Canada, India. India is a major space power. Uh, what is for sure is that with relatively modest budgets, because our budget is 4 billion euros, NASA's budget is about 15 billion dollars or 17 billion dollars, uh, and uh, it's not the only spending for space in the US. So Europe has a, a fairly modest spending in space, but with that, it manages quite well. It is uh, certainly a leader in space science, uh, Earth sciences, which is understanding how our planet works, uh, the different components, atmosphere, oceans, lands, uh, ice, how do they interact with each other? So it's, it's a crucial uh, effort to understand climate change and environmental uh, effects. We are also very good in uh, services, but I am sure uh, Michel will, will talk about that. Uh, we have not uh, invested in human spaceflight, so this is the sector in which we have not really invested, but we are uh, uh, also leader in commercial uh, launchers with uh, the Ariane launcher and Ariane Espace. I'm sure many of you ha have heard about that. So I would like to say this spending provides economic return, but also societal benefits, uh, improving the knowledge, improving our knowledge of our planet, improving our knowledge of the universe, and also applications. Because uh, we mentioned, Ray has mentioned it, you have mentioned it, uh, space can provide many services. And nowadays, we, uh, we integrate uh, the different uh, disciplines of space, for instance, Earth observation, telecoms, navigation to provide integrated services. You mentioned disaster management. For instance, space can intervene in all phases of disaster management and mitigation. Space can help uh, forecast. For instance, if you look at forest fires, you want to know the dryness of the soil because that tells you where a forest fire is likely to take place. And with space, with, with satellites, you can make mapping of uh, soil dryness. You can also, in certain cases, uh, you can have an early warning. You can have an early warning of volcanic eruptions, an early warning of floods. Uh, so all these, obviously, of weather events. You have an early warning of hurricanes, of cyclones, etc. So all these help uh, prepare for the disaster. Once the disaster has happened, uh, unfortunately it does happen uh, most of the time, uh, space means are crucial to manage the uh, operations, the rescue, uh, to help uh, with disaster management. So 
with space means you can replace the infrastructure which has been destroyed because it is very frequent when you have a disaster that the terrestrial infrastructure is destroyed, telecoms or whatever, so you can immediately replace it with space means. You can also help the rescue teams to locate themselves and to go about because usually when a major disaster has hit a country, uh, uh, infrastructures such as bridges, roads, etc., have been damaged. So you can give the rescue teams a rapid map, what we call rapid mapping, which helps them uh, orient themselves. They know which bridge they can still use or which they cannot use, which road they can still use, where they have to go, where is rescue most needed. So that is crucial in disaster management. It also helps in uh, recovery after the, the disaster in building up, uh, recovering, space can also help. So you see, if you only take the example of disaster management, space helps. But there are many other sectors. You can talk about education, tele-education, and in India uh, uh, it is a major application for space. You can talk about medicine, telemedicine, in many remote areas. The only way to get uh, medical care is through space means, because you do not have doctors who are able to come uh, when you have a problem instantaneously. They are remote, so it is a, it is a very important application. You, managed, uh, you, you mentioned uh, food. Uh, it is true that uh, there is a, an important new application sector for space, which is agriculture. Uh, space can help you maximize the yield of the crops. So you put less, uh, um, uh, I don't know how you say that. Fertilizer. Yes, you put less fertilizer, which is better for the, everyone's health, and you maximize the yield of the crops. Uh, you also can uh, find uh, spots of resources using uh, earth observation. So you have many, many sectors. Uh, one last sector which I would like to mention is energy. Uh, energy is, we all know, a main challenge for the future. It so happens that when you look at space systems, they have to be uh, energetically uh, uh, Correct. It means that they have to be, they have to consume as little as they can. They have to uh, carry as little fuel as they can because uh, they they are. I mean, space systems are by nature uh, very good at saving energy, and also uh, they use solar cells, which is now very interesting also for terrestrial applications. So space technology helps us with energy. In the future, it could even help us more if we one day manage to, uh, to, to gather the energy from the sun and perhaps uh, bring it down to Earth. But also, with space means, you manage the power grids, you manage the power systems which distribute energy on Earth. And by the way, should we lose the use of satellites, in particular GPS, we would have problems with our energy distribution systems because they all rely on GPS for synchronization and distribution of power. So this is one thing we usually forget. Space is also helpful in this uh, type of application. So I think this is what I can say, but I could say much, much more. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, two things uh, press me. The first thing is really uh, what I get um, from my buck. And, um, the economic return is, is a fascinating to see, especially in Europe and, of course, in, in, in North America, also due to the financial crisis. So um, your data is, is quite convincing to me, and I'm sure to, to our audience also, that if you spend one euro, you get at least two to four euros in return. I think that creates job, and that I think that's very good. And the other one, I, I think on, on rescue, um, search and rescue, um, if, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. COSPART um, SARSAT yes. satellite system has saved over 30,000 lives. And I think this is where the wonders of invisible hand is, <laughs> is, is there. Thank you. Um, our third speaker is Michel de Rochon, and he's the chief executive officer, UTELSAT. UTELSAT people who do not know, is the, one of the largest operators of telecommunication um, system. And uh, Michelle, tell us about this individual, individual hand 
if I want to make a car from diverse to small remote town in China, <laughs> how does it, who takes my car there? <laughs> Thanks. Um, Thank you, uh, Ram. A, a word, if I may, uh, about um, the Utel set. I don't know how many people uh, in this room have seen the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick. You may uh, not know that this movie was made from a book brought by uh, an American uh, called Clark. And Clark was both a science fiction writer but he was also uh, a great scientist. And so he was working just, say, I'm saying this in a school. <laughs> he was working with paper and a pen mm. and his brain. And he calculated, just with his intelligence and education, that if you put a satellite at 36,000 kilometers from the Earth, it would be at the right altitude so that gravity would not take the satellite down, <laughs> but also that the distance would not be set, the satellite would simply drift away. So he invented, with again, a paper, a pen, and his brain, the theory of what is called geostationary <coughs> satellites. And so our satellites are indeed so-called communications satellites. They are at 36, to be precise, 35,650 kilometers from the Earth above the equator. And there are approximately 160 such satellites, out of which 29 are from my uh, company. When I say my, I'm only the CEO, I don't own the company. Okay? <laughs> Utelsat is a European company very European, our headquarters are in Paris and we have 27 nationalities in our headquarters. Okay, so most European countries' nationalities are represented. So, if I may, let's imagine, let's imagine that uh, satellite communications for one day stop working, something happens, okay? I, I, I brought here a few figures to share with you about what this would mean. There would be black screens for 27,000 TV channels. 27,000 TV channels. On our own satellites, we have more than 4,000 TV channels, just you tell said. There would be no TV at all for over 20% of homes that have TV worldwide this is more than 350 million homes that have TV only because of through satellites. Hundreds of millions of Africans would have no mobile phones. You have approximately 1 billion people who live in Africa, 500 million mobile phones, out of which 60% work because satellites enable them to work. So suddenly, if there were no satellites, 60% of the 500 million mobile phones in Africa would not work anymore. There would be no coverage, obviously, of news breaking events across the world, in Davos, in China, <laughs> or anywhere else. There would be no internet connections for several million users. There would be, of course, no disaster recovery. Uh, exercise initiatives as the one that uh, Geraldine was uh, describing. So suffice it to say, many things would stop happening and that could impact negatively and dramatically the life of hundreds of millions of people. So without being too long, why, why are satellites important for mankind? And why are they important for the coming, why will they be more important in the coming years than in the past years? I believe there are three simple reasons to that. <coughs> One reason is that people use more and more the internet. There is more and more data flowing from, one, from different parts of the world to other parts of the world. And you, this flow, increasing flow, needs satellites to take part of it because there is an increasing <coughs> congestion 
of the flow of data. The second reason, and saying this in the middle of the Swiss Alps, is that terrestrial technologies cannot go everywhere. Okay? Millions and millions of people can only be connected because of satellites. When I was a student, there was a great philosopher called McLuhan who spoke of a global village. And the global village then sounded like utopia. <laughs> well, the global village now becomes possible, but for some people, it, it requires satellite services. And the third reason that satellites are also fundamentally uh, necessary for the future is that terrestrial technologies like fibers are great technologies, but they make no it makes no economic sense to use them everywhere. It can be estimated that it takes approximately 10,000 euros to bring fiber to someone who lives far in the country or in the mountains. That is, of course, an absurdly an extravagant type of cost. So for millions and millions of people, including in Europe and many more in other continents, the satellite is the only rational way to be connected to the rest of the world. So, Ram, this is what I maybe wanted to say. This is Thank you very much, Michel. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm very thankful to you that you started a presentation um, explaining the work done by Arthur C. Clarke. Um, I personally owe a lot of um, gratitude to him because I did my doctoral degree on his concept of geostationary satellite orbit. Mm -hmm. And when I did it in, back in 83, not ages, um, people even in the space law discipline were concerned, what is this geostationary orbit? <laughs> and thanks to, to his, his ideas, now, there's a small similarity between him and me, of he was much more intelligent than me, <laughs> uh, that he used his pen and brain. I think that's what I did. Mm -hmm. I did not have a computer, mm -hmm. certainly not internet. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, I was fascinated, but <clears throat> you gave a very good answer to that. And I am uh, fascinated by your figure that 60% of 500 million Africans will not be in a position to use their mobile phone. That you're talking about 300 million people? I think that one uh, data is good enough to justify or explain the benefit of, of satellite for telecommunications. Not all, all other things what you said in that, I think it is. And I'm, I'm also glad that you have already touched on the second topic we'll get to do, life without satellites. Mm -hmm. So that brings us our, 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 our fourth speaker um, in, in, in debate. Brian Whedon is a technical advisor to Secure World Foundation based in, in, in United States. Secure World Foundation, in my view, is perhaps the most active and competent NGO in space sector. And Brian, good friend of mine, and I was privileged uh, to be in his company, and I learned a lot from him from two, two, in two areas. One is his military um, background helps me understand the importance of space for military, and I will say conflict resolution. And the second is his, his experience in making very difficult technical terms <laughs> to be to a, a, some less technical person like me, if I <laughs> don't say. Brian, tell us the use of satellites for conflict resolution, how to avoid conflicts, what happens in conflict rises, and then we'll come to the others. Brian. Thank you, Ram. Um, satellites have played a large role in national security for decades. In fact, some of the very first uses of satellites were by the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Since then, some of those uses have expanded uh, to being used by other countries and, and, and also to perhaps more of a global perspective. Uh, for example, we've known for a long time, the United States and the Soviet Union and others have used satellites to capture imagery of the Earth to determine 
where there are armies and where there are troops and where there are potential military activities. Now, there are commercial companies that are selling satellite imagery uh, at half a meter resolution, which means the smallest thing you can see in one of those photographs is a half a meter in size that can be bought on the open market with a credit card over the internet. And there are new uses for this data that are being found. Uh, one recent one uh, is a project called SentinelSat uh, that uh, gained the headlines uh, last year uh, in, the, in its use of data and imagery on what was going on in South Sudan that was being used by NGOs to put pressure on governments for human rights abuses. And they had actual imagery that showed that there were villages being burned and that there were uh, atrocities being committed and that in turn put pressure on governments. That would not have been possible without satellites that were able to, to take this imagery and, and be distributed to uh, you know, NGOs and private citizens in the public to be then to be used for political pressure. Uh, so, and, and there are going to be more examples of the use of satellite imagery and other satellite data as it gets beyond just governments into the hands of the public and into the hands of NGOs uh, that will be used for the global good. To pick up on a few of the themes that have already been addressed and provide some more specific examples. Uh, in the case of disaster response, when the earthquake struck Haiti, uh, satellites played a major role in the disaster response. Using some of these same commercial satellites, they were able to take uh, very high-res images of uh, Port-au-Prince and the areas affected by the earthquake and using tools developed by Google and other software companies, be able to determine exactly which buildings were destroyed, what it looked like before the earthquake and after the earthquake, to help rescuers target the places where people were most likely to be found to try and save lives. Back to the issue of navigation systems, um, it turns out that if you have uh, atomic clocks are very useful in that they generate an extremely precise time, but they're expensive and they're, they're, uh, they're not very small, at least not yet. Well, all of these global positioning system satellites, GPS satellites and others, have atomic clocks and these signals can be picked up anywhere on Earth. So in addition to navigation, there are a whole host of other uses that people have found that are very interesting, innovative ways to make use of a highly precise timing signal. It was already mentioned coordination uh, of, of several activities on Earth, uh, but the banking sector is another one. You have all of these automated electronic banking transactions going on m a, a rapid pace, more rapid than humans can detect, uh, and in so many cases they're using the precise navigation signal from the GPS satellites to calculate and timestamp exactly when these transactions happened to help keep track of when they were and who moved first and who moved last and the values of various goods. Uh, there's also multiple fields within scientific research that have opened up because you can now more precisely measure things using these accurate timing signals. Uh, so research into tectonic plates and earthquake detection and a whole host of other things have developed. Uh, the global shipping network uh, uses a system called AIS, uh, which is a device that you can put on a ship that communicates the ship's location and other data up to satellites. And they're being used to coordinate global shipping uh, and, and in some cases to help with navigation through tight spots, but also they're being used if there's an accident at sea or if a ship gets lost to help try and locate in a search and rescue effort. Uh, and the very last thing I'd like to touch on is something that was mentioned by Ray to begin with, uh, and that's something called near-Earth objects. Uh, near-Earth objects are asteroids uh, that orbit the sun in a very similar orbit to the Earth. And we know over the history of the Earth, the Earth has been struck many times by these asteroids. Uh, and they range in sizes from you know, a few small meters that burn up in the atmosphere to hundreds of meters uh, potentially even kilometers uh, that many think may have been what wiped out some of the dinosaurs. And we know that in the future, the Earth will be struck again. So 
part of what we can do with space now is we have potentially some of the tools to be able to prevent this from happening should we in the future detect an asteroid that will be on a collision course with Earth. And that would involve various technologies to actually change its orbit so that it doesn't intersect the Earth. Uh, and, and that could be a, a major, I mean, it, it's, we're at the point where we almost have the tools to save our own species from extinction. Uh, and that is a pretty revolutionary thing. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much, Brian. So it not only um, the satellites not only help us live our modern life, but also can guarantee our survival. Maybe. <laughs> can guarantee or help us surviving in that. Uh, that's good. We have already touched um, life without satellites. Um, I think we should pursue a little bit further than that. Uh, of course, all the benefits which have been described, they will not be available with the satellites are not there. Um, so the question before us is really to see what are the threats, what are the risks for the utilization of, of satellite. Um, life without satellites in, in certain way. I would like to, to ask our panelists to, to expand a little bit more on that. Coming again to, to raise point here is the, the benefit of space. Space has to be secure. How how we can secure that? What 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 are the, the risks uh, involved in that? No, again, anybody can take the floor. I can yeah. start with a brief. You know? Yeah, please. Okay. Well, one of the biggest challenges that Ray mentioned is, is something we call space debris. Yeah. Uh, there are approximately a thousand satellites that are currently orbiting the Earth that are being used for a variety of purposes. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of other stuff up there that is essentially the leftovers of our activities in space uh, over the last several decades. And collectively, these dead satellites and, and used rocket bodies and, and small pieces and nuts and bolts are known as space debris. There are currently about 21,000 pieces of space debris, bigger than 10 centimeters, that we know exist. And, and we're tracking, we know the locations of them. Uh, and, and the scientists that research this know that there's approximately another uh, half million objects down to one centimeter that also exist in orbit. And all of these objects are moving around the Earth at speeds between seven kilometers a second and four kilometers per second. <clears throat> and so if you can imagine a car crash on Earth at speeds of you know, 100 kilometers with two cars, can you imagine a car crash between two objects traveling at seven kilometers per second? And what's even more significant is that on the Earth, if you have a car crash, well, you come by with tow trucks and you pull the cars out of the way and you sweep up the street, everything's fine. But the way that the physics work with satellites, when you have a car crash in space, uh, the debris ends up staying in orbit for, along with all the satellites for a very, very long time. Uh, in 2009, there was a crash between an American and a Russian satellites. And there was uh, approximately 2,000 additional pieces of debris created by this collision that are going to be in orbit for decades. Uh, and of course, that means that there are more chances for this debris to impact other objects and cause more clashes, which again causes more, more debris. Space is, is vast, trillions and trillions of square kilometers. But the debris exists in the few areas that we use. And so it actually coexists with all of our satellites. And the research now shows that we can expect a collision like that to happen on the average of every five to 10 years. And as more collisions happen, we're going to end up with even with a faster pace of rate of growth of debris. Thank you very much. Uh, Could I add something on that? Please, yeah. Okay. I, it is true. It is, it is almost a vicious circle because the debris created then lead to more collision, to more debris. And if we, if we don't do anything, the situation will be worse anyway. So 
it is not a question of stopping to create debris. At one point, it will be a question of how to remove some of the debris. I would just like to add something, is that this debris issue f is mostly concerning the, what we call the low Earth orbit. So it's the area between, let's say, 300 to 1,000 kilometers around the Earth. So uh, it is less of a concern for higher orbits. But unfortunately, this is also the area where we have the space station. You know, we have the International Space Station, which is orbiting ab above our heads. Uh, it is permanent permanently inhabited by six astronauts, uh, Americans, Russians, uh, Japanese, uh, Canadians, Europeans. Uh, and it is frequently now that the space station has to maneuver to avoid uh, debris. It is very frequently also that uh, space operators have to maneuver their satellites to avoid them being destroyed by debris or to avoid collision. And by the way, maneuvering the satellites means that you use the fuel and means that the satellites have a, a, a lower lifetime. So you reduce the lifetime of satellites, you are less efficient. So for many reasons, it is now becoming a really urgent issue to address because we cannot continue like that. Already, all the space agencies and space operators are taking measures to ensure that they do not create additional debris. For instance, when you launch a rocket, you make sure that uh, you, uh, the, the pieces of the rocket will go down, burning through the atmosphere, and will not stay in orbit, uh, creating more waste. And all the, the space agencies now take care that at least they do not uh, aggravate the situation. But I think the problem is now how to decrease the number of debris, and we are reflecting of a, a number of solutions, technical solutions, but there are no real technical solutions operational for the time being. Thank you. So that means if I want to go to space with my wife, I have to be very careful. Yes. <laughs> Not only for debris reasons, but yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> Brian, you mentioned about... Uh, the I think Michel so, wanted Michel? to... Yeah. Um, not on debris, because... Um, and not only for your wife who's sitting here, but um, <laughs> for, I believe, anybody. Yeah, it's good to be cautious when you uh, go to uh, space. <laughs> but because you uh, spoke of threats, if I may, I'd like to uh, add um, a few uh, considerations. The first consideration is that, you know, we're of course very excited by what we all do. It's interesting to remember that the history of mankind with space is a very recent history. The Sputnik was launched by the Soviet Union less than 55 years ago. And 55 years compared to the history of mankind is just, you know, one second compared to what mankind has been doing in other fields. So we are at the beginning of what I believe will be for thousands of years an extraordinary <coughs> adventure going forward. The second comment I want to make is um, it's, it's good to, when we speak of threats, you know, it can be quite chilly. Oh, my God, you know. I'd, I'd like to share two figures with you. Uh, a communication satellite in 1985 weighed one ton, carried seven television channels, and lasted for, uh, lived for approximately seven years. A communications satellite launched in 2012 weighs six tons, can live up to 20 years, and can serve 1,000 television channels, okay? So in terms of durability of using rare resources, this is a huge progress, okay? The third comment I want to make is now another threat, <coughs> which is jamming. In our uh, life, jamming is a serious topic. And there are two types of jamming. One is voluntary jamming. The other one is involuntary <laughs> jamming. Voluntary jamming is when a country <coughs> decides that what some 
TV channels or radio channels are saying should not be heard by the people <coughs> of that country. This is called censorship. <laughs> okay? It is opposed to freedom of uh, information. And um, <coughs> to be uh, blunt, I'll give you one example. We uh, carry on our satellites a channel called BBC Farsi. BBC Farsi gives news in Farsi language, which of course people who live in Iran are particularly interested in. And we also carry Deutsche Welle, or Voice of America. So all these channels, <coughs> what do they do? They bring information that people want to hear when they don't want to hear uh, propaganda. And um, especially, if you remember, a few years ago, it was the 30th anniversary of the uh, revolution. And um, there was a lot of attention then given <coughs> to Iran and from Iran to news. And um, when these television channels brought news in Farsi language to Iran, there was a lot of voluntary jamming to prevent Iranian people from having access to these news. Okay. And so I just want to say, here we are in Davos, whose aim is, I believe, to make the world a better world. I believe that voluntary jamming is bad, is bad. And it ha just happens that the worldwide conference on telecommunications has started in Geneva a few days ago. They meet uh, from time to time, thousands of people. I hope that this conference will address this topic and that mm. progress would be made in building a worldwide consensus on the fact that voluntary jamming is simply unacceptable. And to finish my comment, then there is voluntary jamming that is more difficult <laughs> to handle because it comes uh, involuntary jamming. It comes with, of course, more, the more data there are, the more than sometimes, indeed, there can be some issues. And I believe that we all, we all, we satellite operators, but also satellite manufacturers, telecom companies, we must do more R&D work to be able to address that uh, topic because as traffic will grow, this issue is bound to grow <coughs> if we don't address it head on. And so I think that is one of, should be, must be, one of our common priorities for the years ahead of us. Thank well, you, Michel. I'd just like to make one comment. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah please, please. I'd like to uh, make one comment on Brian's comments about space debris. And I mentioned the, the need for collaboration, global collaboration and, and coordination. And, and space debris is an important area. A few years ago, uh, the Chinese demonstrated an anti-satellite capability against one of their uh, non-working weather satellites. And it created a tremendous amount of space debris. And uh, the purpose of the test was to effectively show that they had that capability. But the downside is uh, there's a tremendous amount of debris that now the ISS has to move, satellites have to move, et, et cetera, et cetera. And so cooperation in, uh, across that is very important. And also uh, jamming affects GPS as well. Uh, GPS, is, as we all know, was developed for military purposes originally. And then, as I said, a billion devices broadly spread to many civilian uses. Uh, it's possible that in a conflict it could be j jammed, uh, tried to be jammed, and that could not only affect the military but also affect the civilian use of that. So it's a, it's a big deal. Thank you very much. I'm glad you, you brought that. That was on my lesson <laughs> great on that. So we have a problem about – sorry? Just one yeah, more please. quick addition to that. A perfect example of what Ray was talking about. Uh, they're starting to move to incorporate GPS – into air traffic systems and particularly aircraft landing systems. Uh, and they were doing some tests uh, in the United States and they discovered that at a certain time every day, the GPS signal at the airport would go out and it would come back and it would happen at the same time every day. And it really, it, people couldn't figure out what was going on until they discovered that there was a delivery truck that would arrive every morning around the same time, and the driver had installed a GPS jammer in the truck because his employer had a GPS tracking device to monitor where he was going, 
<laughs> and he, of course, didn't want them to know where he was going. Uh, and, and these are things that you can buy off the Internet for not a whole lot of money, uh, and they're fairly simple to operate. But in this case, the unintended consequences were that everywhere he was going, it was jamming GPS around him in a fairly significant area. Uh, and, and so it's not, it's not an easy solution to try and prevent some of these problems. Uh, and, and some of these problems are, I mean, obviously he didn't intend to. So that's to, intentional, unintentional jamming? Uh, well, I mean, he <laughs> intended to jam GPS in his truck, but he did not intend to jam <laughs> GPS at the airport. <laughs> that was just a, a side thank, effect. <laughs> thank you very much. That, that's quite interesting uh, to see that. So that means to build a GPS satellite to launch it, you need uh, a rocket scientist. But to jam <laughs> it, you don't need to be a rocket scientist, right? <laughs> So that underlines, and I'm sure there are other, other risks. Uh, I don't know if you want to add anything to more risks. Oh, the, no, yeah. the, the, uh, I was going to make a comment about the uh, tracking of the debris, though. There are, there are many initiatives now, as you mentioned, going down to one centimeter. And so uh, we're actually involved in, in a new radar that uh, will help catalog and identify the very small pieces so that we can do a better job of avoidance because of the uh, tremendous damage that can be caused at that speed. That's good. Um, question of jamming, question of censorship, question of space debris, anti-satellite systems, the list can go on and on. So that these risks, threats to space utilizations are serious and ca can make our life more difficult to the point perhaps space might become very difficult to utilize. One of the the implication of those, those risks, uh, I would say threat to an industry, space industry itself, which is about $300 billion industry today, which creates hundreds of thousands of jobs in, 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 in that situation. Now, um, so what should be done about it? What can be done about it? <laughs> I personally would like to, to have very straightforward, daring solutions which may not be acceptable to the governments <laughs> or anybody else because it is you and me who are going to be suffering. And I think we should be convinced these steps must be taken to secure the world, uh, um, to secure space for our benefits. Again, <laughs> anybody wants to add? Michelle, you, you mentioned a few, few points. You want to, the question of jamming. Should it be prohibited, how it could be prohibited, and how it could be, that prohibition could be implemented? So, <coughs> I think the, the, Ram, the question you're raising is in fact a very uh, broad one. All, you know, probably all the people in this room are here because they have an interest or, or even some passion for uh, space matters. And it's easy to be passionate about space, it's extraordinary. Uh, however, uh, if we look ahead, choices are going to have to be made. Um, space investments in uh, satellites, launchers, new projects are uh, expensive, cost uh, money. Geraldine reminded us of the figures across, uh, you know, of different uh, countries or groups of countries, and. It is also clear, it's been heard in Davos a lot this week, that governments have in, in, in Europe and the US are going to try to save money because of the deficits and the debts that have been accumulated. So um, choices are going to have to be made. We can't just say because it is space, we must do it and accumulate projects which then taxpayers will one day say, hey, why should we do all of this, we cannot have taxes go up. So that's a general comment. In that general comment, I would um, volunteer the following uh, recommendations. One recommendation <coughs> is that uh, when we look at different projects, we should look at what they bring to mankind. How do they make the life of people better? In other words, I was brought up in the world of the two blocks, when the Soviet bloc and the so-called free world bloc were fighting each other. 
and there was sort of a competition, you use the word competition, you know, if they do it, we'll do it, you know, <laughs> there was the Soviet Sputnik, and then uh, Kennedy said, we'll go to the moon before the Soviets, etc., etc. And of course, competition, emulation, does create progress because people are incented to do better. But on the other hand, now that great things have been achieved, the question remains, when we look at all the many projects that can be uh, started and completed in the coming 10 to 20 years, which are the ones that should be given top priority? And I'm recommending that the key criterion be not the prestige of the states or the countries, not the so-called sovereignty, but what does it bring to mankind, to the day-to-day -day life of people? That's my uh, second comment on that. My third comment is that uh, in that context, I believe that uh, a very uh, important priority should be for the 10 or 20 years to come to make sure that every person across the world be connected. So the broadband for all, so that it's not just for the happy few, for one half of humanity or 60% of humanity, but I believe it should be a goal that broadband be accessible to people, to everybody, except my mother who doesn't want broadband, <laughs> to everybody across, uh, across the world. Um, I, I say that because, you know, I'm French. In France, you hear a lot about très haut débit, sort of, very high broadband, and there are goals and talks about that. That's great, but let's first make sure that everybody has access to broadband before we put too much energy on very high uh, broadband. And if I may, Ram, um, I'll finish with the following uh, two comments. Some topics, can uh, we can make significant progress by just goodwill and strong work and they don't, we don't need budgets. <coughs> jamming, voluntary jamming is a good example. If this becomes a real important cause for the uh, nations, who are the United Nations, and if they make it a priority, and you know, jamming is not just only done by Iran, other countries, other countries in the Western world also do jamming, okay? So this is not such an easy topic. It will take courage for countries <coughs> to agree that indeed jamming is not acceptable. So I'm just saying this one doesn't need money, taxpayers' money, it needs courage. Last comment is that the papers, the newspapers have been full <coughs> in recent uh, weeks about the plans of China in space for the coming five years. And just as there was competition between the Soviet Union and the US in space, you can see it coming that there will be now some kind of competition between China and the US. And I would recommend, just as a citizen, uh, an approach where China, where the big, the big powers, US, China, European Union, Russia, India, the five leaders in space, instead of saying, I want to do better than them, but would work together, there is already which is a big progress of the past 10 years, collaboration between Russia and the US. If you had said that 30 years ago, people would have said, what? Collaboration between Russia and US? People would have said, no way. Well, I'm recommending the same, the same between US and China and European Union and Russia and India. I believe it's a way to save money and to bring people together <coughs> and to do great things together. Thank you very much, and that ties into what Ray said to start with. International cooperation and collaboration is, is must. Um, Geraldine, I'd like you to have add one, one thing if I could. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, you mentioned uh, <coughs> President Kennedy's uh, comment about uh, going to the moon by the end of, of the decade. There were many reasons for making that comment, and I think it became uh, a clear, passionate goal of the United States to achieve that which they did. And as I said, there, there are competitive reasons and other reasons. And it became a passion. In fact, if you talk to people working in engineering today, uh, especially those who were entering the field then, many of them say, I started in this business because of, of the uh, space program. I got the passion for my technical field. 
So we're struggling with jobs, and we're struggling with STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math, and not just in the United States, in fact, globally. And uh, so there are certain attributes of space and the excitement that it brings. But I think what, where we are today is uh, many nations, including the United States, are lacking a specific strategic plan uh, for what's next. And having moved away from uh, that Cold War conflict to what's next, having gone to the moon <laughs> a long time ago now, I think you're, you're, you pointed out uh, several unique attributes. Let's, let's kind of do a contrast. Let me contrast uh, the cost of terrestrial landlines in China versus mobile phones. It would be impossible to, to landline wire China or India, but look what's happened with the explosion of mobile devices because of the ease with which that, and the affordability with which that can happen. I think space offers unique advantages that should be considered, I mentioned in my introductory comments, a systems engineering approach. To, take, to make actual comparisons between terrestrial systems, between space systems, see where the advantages lie. I'm, sure, I'm quite sure the 300 million people in Africa who have mobile access because of space assets are uh, delighted with that ability. But it's not just providing broadband. It's using broadband for other ways. It's thinking about how broadband, how uh, space-based connections can produce sustainable business models that can bring food and water and health care to, to rural villages in Africa and India and other places in the world. To think more broadly about what space can do, where the niche uh, services can be derived from, and then all of a sudden the cost-benefit analysis it becomes much easier when you look at it from that systems engineering and strategic planning approach. Thank you very much. Uh, we got to stop in three minutes from our side. so. Um, Geraldine, do you want to talk about European initiative to come up with the code of conduct mm -hmm. for securing um, yeah. space? Yeah. Um, just to bounce back on Apollo, uh, the Apollo astronauts said, we left to discover the moon and we have discovered the Earth. And I think it is true that when you, it is this uh, conscious conscience that the Earth is a very small, finite place with limited resources which came from the space program. It's a very small place in the big black universe. So I think, indeed, space can help us solve some Earth challenges. <coughs> we mentioned energy, food, disasters, etc. And I think, indeed, we, we need to have broadband for everyone. But first, we need to have water and food for everyone, I think. So I I for all these reasons, Space can contribute, and honestly, for a relatively small cost, because we talk about billions of euros or dollars, it sounds huge. But if you look at the cost, for instance, of what it costs to build a highway, well, it's much more expensive, I tell you, to build a highway than to build a satellite. I mean, it, the, 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 the real budgets of space agencies are actually quite small. This being said, I think our objective is nowadays we want to share the benefits. You mentioned very rightly space started as a dominance tool. It was, uh, the, the reason was to be better, to be leading the other. Now space is a tool for cooperation. It is a tool, it, it is a tool for peace. I mean, when you look at the International Space Station, it is true you have Russians, Americans, Japanese, Europeans, Canadians cooperating and perhaps Chinese in a fairly short-term future. It is a tool for peace and for collaboration, and perhaps it is a tool that can replace, if I may say, perhaps I'm being optimistic, conflicts. Instead of fighting each other, we can do things together, uh, in particular using space. And finally, there is also one thing we have not mentioned. It is a tool for answering questions. After all, everyone around the Earth wonders, is there life elsewhere? We haven't mentioned it. It <coughs> is a pressing question, perhaps not one that needs, that requires to invest lots of money, but after all, it is a compelling question. Are we alone? Is there uh, life elsewhere in the universe? And that also, I think, is a question we must seek to answer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Brian, did you have Just a very quickly, uh, <coughs> on the topic of potential solutions, I will just bring up two. One is uh, acknowledgement by both governments and companies and everyone else who operates in space that the space environment is fragile. 
and that the long-term sustainability of the space environment should be a priority. Uh, and that means looking at what you are doing in space with an eye towards, is it going to have negative long-term impacts on the space environment? And the second thing would be uh, norms of behavior. It was easy uh, when space first started, it was just the United States of the Soviet Union using space. There was kind of a gentleman's agreement about you know, what we did and didn't do, and both sides kind of understood how to operate in space. Now there are nearly 60 countries that are operating at least one satellite. And every year there are more countries adding additional satellites. Uh, and not everyone knows what is responsible behavior and what is irresponsible behavior. Uh, and, and so a, a, a discussion, a dialogue between all those countries on what are norms of behavior uh, and what is responsible and irresponsible behavior is, is a much needed step. Good, thank you very much. Now we have 25 minutes, it's your turn. Anybody <laughs> have any question? The gentleman there. Listening to the learned um, gentleman and lady out there, I had the impression that you were trying to sell us satellites. I was uh, feeling like an, an advertising action. And uh, when I was young, I heard the song of the Deep Purple saying the dark side of the moon, and the satellite is an artificial moon, so there was very little we heard about the dark side of these moons. And uh, quite in particular, uh, the Orwellian uh, uh, action and uh, concept of global surveillance of uh, intelligence chips implanted into individual uh, citizens losing their freedom and not just vans that the boss want to track down, but individuals uh, around the whole world who uh, should be observed. Now, this is something that I think uh, should be mentioned, I, and I would very much like to ask the most courageous of you to take up this issue. Um, while we were waiting to come in to uh, listen to you, we were given a leaflet saying, uh, quoting Orwell, saying um, that in a time of global control and surveillance, it is a revolutionary act to speak the truths. May I encourage you to be revolutionary? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any person dear? Sounds like a law question to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a law question. If I, if I sure, Michelle. Thank um, you, Michelle, taking up this challenge. And I, <laughs> so I don't know your name, but I don't pretend to be more courageous than my colleagues, okay? Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, um, but I'd like to, um, to make uh, two uh, comments. One is that speaking for uh, the world I know, which is geostationary satellites, <coughs> um, we are not involved at all in any way in anything that is observation. We are in the business of telecommunications, not in observation. So um, I very <coughs> candidly, this is not about courage or no courage, I candidly have no um, interesting uh, knowledge to uh, share with you on this topic. We are not involved in any way in observation. The second comment I want to make is, to come back to what you said at the beginning, you get the impression that we are selling. Um, the four of us were invited to attend this panel, and we were not invited to sell. We were invited to share uh, information and knowledge and debate between ourselves and with you. And I believe a key reason for that is that the satellite world is not well known. Um, I, I can tell you, you know, I meet senior officials, government, cabinet members, and so I, I, I sometimes ask them, you know, we have geostationary satellite. They say, what? You know? So I ask them, do you know how high we are? And very senior people, including very famous people, tell me 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers, maybe, come on. 50, and when I say 36,000, they say, ah, oh, no. So the, the level of knowledge, of understanding of what we do is in fact very, uh, very, uh, uh, I would say, insufficient. And I'll give you one concrete example. 
We launched, uh, my company launched a satellite um, in December 2010, which became operational in June 2011, called CARSAT. So it is today the second most powerful satellite in the world, and it delivers broadband services across all of Europe, North Africa, some countries of Central Asia, and the Gulf states. And we are not, um, we are a B2B company. We are not a B2C company. For those who don't know this jargon, it means we work with companies. We don't work in, with people. Our clients work with individual people, okay? And so, one, uh, uh, this satellite is a fantastic satellite. The launch went very well. The services we provide, up to 10 megabits to people on broadband who live in places like the Alps or countries or far from cities. The service is terrific. Our main challenge is that about commercial success is that many people don't know that we exist, don't know that satellites can provide this kind of services because they believe that it's, the future is only in fibers. And so I have to confess, when I got this invitation, I thought I'll come and maybe I can do a little, not selling, but information, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sarah, do you want to supplement? Yes, it, it is true that space is, is a unique means of gathering information, including gathering information of uh, localization and retransmitting it instantaneously and everywhere. So it is this uh, function which may lead to users. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. It's very difficult to discriminate, obviously, when you have such a powerful technology between the good and the bad users. I do believe that there is a, a notion of ethics at one point that you have to raise. Uh, we were mentioning debris and the fact that it is up to the space-faring nations to take responsibility. We mentioned a code of conduct for uh, space-faring nations. Uh, the, the uses that can be made, some of them, I agree, uh, may be unpleasant. Now, if you want to avoid that, you should not have a mobile phone, I tell you <laughs> clearly. But um, I think it, it, there is a, a true uh, question of space ethics. And I think, by the way, Davos is not a bad place uh, to reflect on the possible bad uses that could be made of, technology is neutral, you know, technology is not bad or good, it's neutral, it's the use that you make of it that can be bad, and we must reflect on it, it's true. Thank you very much. The gentleman back. Yeah. Sorry, the, the one, yeah, the one who is standing, excuse no. me, sir, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my, my name is Stefan Kleinsorger. I'm a business consultant and live in Strasbourg in France. I work for the aerospace business as a, as a head of finance, and I'm interested in business ethics today. Mm -hmm. So my question goes into the, nearly the same direction, but a little bit differently, because my statement is satellites are not democratically supervised. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second statement is space is a free good which should be open to all. So don't we need an international framework which forces all nations which are operating satellites to give a certain portion of their satellites as a free good as well? Because if I understand the world correctly, the, for example, the US government still can threat the world by switching off GPS for national security reasons. And if that would happen, we would not have all the goodies you mentioned for the ha last hour. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Yes. I'm not American, but I am the space agency person here, so I can reply to you on that. Um, first of all, I don't know about NASA, but I know about ESA. Scientific data from our satellites is free. It's open. You can have access to it. Our Earth observation satellites also you can have access to the data. So that clearly, our, our goal is to share the data and to maximize the services that can made, be made use, uh, using this data. That is clearly our goal, is to ensure that everyone can use this data for the best possible purposes. 
second point, you talk about GPS. It is true, or at least it was true, but there is no monopoly of GPS anymore. Now, GPS is one of the navigation systems available worldwide. And the, te the, the temptation to use a monopoly as a tool obviously disappears once the monopoly is gone. Because if you have several systems which you can use, and by the way, which are being made interoperable, so there is also the idea to, to cooperate between these systems, it means you cannot do this kind of blackmailing anymore. And that is why, in particular, uh, Europe has uh, constructed its GPS system called Galileo, which should be soon uh, available. But also China has, uh, has, is putting together its GPS or its navigation system, Russia. So I think it is less the case when space benefits become shared and when more and more nations are developing their systems. It, makes it more available to everyone. But this being said, when you say, I'm, I'm, I'm challenged by your statement that space is not democratic. Uh, I think maybe space, building satellites, if you wish, is the privilege of rich nations, but having access to space data is democratic. Because as I said, at least our, our satellites, you can have free access to it. Thank you, Michel. I'd like to um, take two stabs at the, uh, your, your very strong statement that satellites are not democratically supervised. Um, in, in my world, the telecoms uh, satellites world, we have in fact two kinds of supervisions. Uh, as a European company, we are, uh, there, is a, there was a legislation uh, called uh, something like Television Without Borders, European legislation of 20 years ago, which organized the fact that any satellite operator based in Europe has to be supervised, is supervised by the national body um, of the country where that company is based. So in our case, we are based in France, and there is a regulatory body called CSA, CSA, Conseil Supérieur de l'Audiovisuel, Superior Council of Audiovisual, you know. They are independent people. And what they do is, uh, in our world, they observe content. We do not observe content, okay? We don't, when a customer comes, we don't say, well, we don't like uh, what you, your show, uh, and so we're not going to take you as a customer. But CSA does that, and if there is something illegal in what the uh, channel does, they have the legal right to write to us and to say, we ask you to stop serving this channel. Okay? I'll give you an example. Um, a few years ago, I got such a letter, we received such a letter from CSA about a channel uh, that was... Uh, working very closely with uh, Hamas. And uh, the order we got from CSA is that that channel was being violently anti-Semitic, saying things like, we must finish the work that Hitler did not finish. Okay? So we got the order and we immediately uh, obeyed and we stopped uh, serving that channel. But the point I'm trying to make to you, which may shock some of you, is that we don't try to judge ourselves the content because we are a company with mostly engineers. Our job is to make satellites work. And legally, if we start saying, yeah, we like those guys, we don't like those guys, etc., then where would that go? And so we respect the law, and the law says that it is the supervisors who are, in the case of France and in the case, I believe, of all other European countries, who are appointed by elected officials to do exactly that job, to be the representatives of the people who then have the right to give us orders. This is about national supervision. Then there is a second field, which is, unit, let's say, global supervision. Our global supervisor is ITU, International Telecommunications Union. This is a United Nations agency based in Geneva, as I told you, the World Conference uh, started this week. And 
they have been appointed by the, created by the United Nations and the member states of the United Nations to try and supervise what we do. And I will tell you, their task is very difficult. And coming back to your statement about, I read it again, satellites are not democratically supervised. What does it mean, democratically <coughs> supervised? What does it mean? Some people, this is a real debate, some people say, let's give this agency of the United Nations teeth so that they can give orders, give member states orders, do this, don't do that. And other people say, hey, those are just experts. How can they give orders to countries where you have elected officials by the people? So where is democracy? Is democracy in this universal United Nations appointed body? Or is it with the elected officials of country per country? I believe it's a combination of the two. I just want to say that the notion of what is democratic is not so simple to define. But we are supervised, we are. Good, thank you. Thank you. All right, good, thank you. Um, okay. There was That's a gentleman okay. there, no. if I, yeah, please. <laughs> Yes, it's um, very interesting, but I have the impression that I've heard this all before. If I think about the uh, nuclear power industry, um, there was also a very steep uh, development curve, and today we're looking at putting an end to nuclear power because the issue of atomic waste was simply uh, pushed us aside and ducked, and uh, now it's um, kind of leading to the end of nuclear power. We might find ourselves in a similar situation with space exploration because of the space problems which you, you've mentioned. Very interesting question. Thank you very much. Yep. Please, Brian. That is an interesting question. Uh, although I would I would caution to say that, you know, when we talk about you know space debris and the risk of collision, for those of you who have seen the the, the Pixar movie Wall-E, there's a scene where he's escaping orbit and gets hit by a satellite. That is the the Hollywood movie of this. Um, it will not be at a point where there is a blanket of debris around the Earth. That's outside the laws of physics. What is the case is that the density of debris will increase to the point where it will become more expensive to have a satellite in certain locations in orbit, and that may make certain missions and certain operations not cost effective. But as far as preventing exploration, that is probably not the case. Uh, because we're talking, uh, today we've been talking about, you know, space debris in the orbit around the Earth. But, of course, with explanation, exploration, we're talking about sending people away from the Earth to the moon, the Mars, asteroids, and other bodies. Um, and in that case, you're just kind of passing through. Uh, it was mentioned that, you know, there is a particular risk to the International Space Station. And in the future, uh, we might look at having <coughs> other laboratories, space stations, and other activities in orbit. And, and that is definitely a concern. Uh, although the, the saving grace is that happens at a low enough altitude, uh, approximately 400 kilometers or so, that the, the Earth's atmosphere, of course, doesn't just stop. It, it goes off for quite a ways. It just gets thinner and thinner. And at that altitude, uh, debris and objects in space only stay there for weeks to a couple of months before they get pulled into the atmosphere. So there is a self-cleaning mechanism uh, that does help protect the lower portions of space, which is where human activity and human space flight will take place. Uh, the, the real risk is more to the robotic satellites that operate up at the higher regions. Thank you very much. You assured me that I can take my wife to low Earth orbit, right? <laughs> Not the Arlen. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> gentlemen there, please, yeah. I would like to go a little counter. Uh, you were mentioned the Arlen satellite, uh, the uh, Chinese attempt to, uh, to bring down satellite down at the uh, Soviet Union. So, uh, <laughs> 
Huh? <coughs> Actually, a successful attempt. Now, do you know is that the only uh, the only attack on a, a satellite up to now? And how many additional debris were created? Mm. And another thing, would it be possible by the United Nations to give pressure on all the nations not to do the such things mm. again? Good question. Yeah. Very the, good question. The, the sure. question, I believe, was uh, what was the what were the number of debris pieces that were created by the yeah. ASAT? Do you know the answer? Uh, uh, about three thousand pieces, larger than ten centimeters, um, and. Uh, tens of thousands smaller than that. Okay. And the 10 centimeter pieces destroy a satellite if they collide. Oh, of course. Right. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, so, so 3,000 pieces large enough to destroy a satellite. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's the way yeah. to think about that. Yeah. In, in terms of the international pressure, I don't know, other, other people may have a, a better view of this than I do. I think there probably the awareness of the impact of doing that uh, was brought to an international light in a way that hadn't been done before. And I think that that, um, that awareness has created more pressure on all nations of the world not to do those kinds of things, but I'm not aware of any particular international or, or UN um, recommendation sanctions or anything else like that that mm -hmm. have to do with uh, space debris. Brian, again, you may know. There were, there were several countries that brought pressure on China after this test. Most were done privately. Uh, I believe it was only Japan that publicly uh, uh, brought up the issue. Uh, there was a significant amount of discussion about this issue in the several different United Nations bodies. Um, and, and interestingly, the Chinese tested the same system three years later in 2010, only they did it in a way that created no debris. Uh, so the, one can infer that uh, um, a lesson was learned and whether or not it was the, the diplomatic pressure or other ways, uh, but they did not repeat what they did. Well, they they want to use LEO, too. Yeah. Ex exactly. <laughs> they have satellites, and they are investing heavily yeah. in, in, in building satellites and building constellations uh, for all the same benefits that everyone else is using it. Uh, and they've had to maneuver a couple of their satellites to avoid pieces of debris from their own anti-satellite test. Uh, so... I believe that it, it you know, unfortunately, it, it was it was a bad thing to happen, but I think there has been a lot learned from it, uh, and you mm. probably will not see something similar in the near future. Thank you. We have time for one short question. Just a general ethical question. Um, speaker Rosen uh, spoke about jamming and uh, the difference between voluntary and involuntary jamming um, and how that was bad and how that censors free speech around the world. But then also spoke about how Western nations, uh, such as France itself, um, uh, censoring his, uh, his company's satellites. And uh, do you think there should be some sort of overarching standard on uh, should hate speech or um, offensive speech be censored or do you think that all free all speech should be allowed to be free and regardless of the costs and if so how does that play in with the idea that jamming uh, voluntary or inv mm. involuntary is uh, good or bad mm. good 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 job Michelle <laughs> you know um, I get every week I told you we have 4,000 television channels on our satellites. Every week I get letters or phone calls from states accusing some television channels that we are serving to be terrorists. The definition of terrorism that some states use is probably different from the one you would use or I would use. Some states consider that any channel that is criticizing them as a terrorist. Okay? So, um, the point I'm trying to make is that you speak of hate speech. What is hate speech? Your definition may be different from the definition of someone else. On, okay? So that's why, um, that's how democracy works. That uh, this has to be legislation. 
And the legislation then says what is indeed acceptable or unacceptable. And then it says who will be the judge about that. And what is, I believe, good is that in, in Europe, we satellite operators, we are considered as not having the right legitimacy to decide this is hate speech, unacceptable, this is not hate speech, acceptable. Okay? And so I think that's the way it should be, that at the end of the day, it's the, it's the people's representatives mm -hmm. who need to vote the appropriate legislation <laughs> after the appropriate debates, like the debates that take place in Davos <laughs> or in many other places. And I'm just cautioning you on the fact that uh, when people are emotional, they may decide that something is unacceptable, and then what becomes acceptable may shrink and shrink and shrink. So it is good that there are some wise people who are the regulatory bodies who at the end of the day make these decisions. I do want to add that I must have been unclear. I did not say that France was jamming. I said that the uh, channels that we are carrying, I mentioned three, BBC, Farsi, Deutsche Welle, Voice of America, have been jammed, and the source of the jamming was clearly Iran. That's what I said. Thank you very much. Um, now, we, we must stop here. And I have three conclusions I picked up from the discussion and presentations. And my conclusions are, I hope you will agree with me, is that satellites are indispensable for modern society and industry. Second is there are risks, some are serious risks, to the sustainable use of satellites for the benefit of all. And the last is international cooperation and collaboration is imperative to mitigate these risks, enhance the benefits of space, which also includes for maintaining or achieving peace on Earth. With that, we conclude our session. But before, I would like you to thank our panelists. Thank you very much. I, I, I thank you very much for your very good audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.